my friends and devotees of Senor Santo Nino, let us all welcome Father Erickson Bore, OSA. Thank you, Sister Gigi, for that kind introduction. So good afternoon, everyone, especially to the devotees of the Santo Nino in Australia and all who participate in this online conference. And I would like to thank Father Percival Sibari for inviting me to be part of this. I am happy to share to you my knowledge on the story of the arrival of Santo Nino in the Philippines and other questions that surrounds its devotion. I would like to welcome all of you and thank all of you for joining this webinar. Uh, it is really my hope that this will help us in our journey of faith. This will deepen our devotion in the Holy Child Jesus, the Señor Santo Nino. So in this talk, I made this outline for us to follow the train of thoughts. Uh, first, we'll just an introduction on the origin of the devotion to the Holy Child. Then origin of the Santo Nino, child as a king. Then the Santo Nino, Ferdinand Magellan and Antonio Pegafetta, that who declared in 1521. Then followed by the Santo Nino, Miguel Lopez de Legazpi and the Augustinians in 1565. Then finally, the Santo Nino as popular devotion, the Cofadia, the dances, the colors of the Santo Nino and the colors of the robes of the Santo Nino. The novena, the gusos, the liturgical calendar, the question why we celebrate it on the third Sunday of January, and the plenary indulgences and the basilica for the church itself. So that would be our, our outline. Now let's start from the beginning, and that is to answer the question how the devotion to the Holy Child or baby Jesus started. The devotion to the Holy Child is not, after all, strange to the Christian world since the introduction of Christmas celebrations and traditions. We all celebrate Christmas. We all love Christmas. And that is based on the gospel accounts of the infancy and childhood of Jesus. Aside from the literary materials, the child of Jesus is also well represented in religious art, both in paintings and sculpture. For example, the baby Jesus in a manger or the baby Jesus being carried. So it was in the Middle Ages that the devotion to the Holy Child started to flourish from the typical Jesus that was in Mary's arms. The baby Jesus got separated from the mother and the manger and venerated separately. I won't go into detail of it, but the origin of Christmas and the devotion to the Holy Child are logically connected. So as you can see in the presentation, so just like that, so first in Mary's arms, then later, so like, like baby Jesus got separated from the, mo the mother, and then later on, Jesus himself in a crib or in, a main, in the manger, you know? So that's the transition or the evolution of the, or the depiction of the sculpture or the of art and to such time that Jesus would become an independent statue or an independent art. We know that Jesus was born like any ordinary child in a manger, but what we see in the Santo Nino is a powerful child. And that is because Spain during this period was the biggest empire in the world. Thus the idea to extend its rule throughout the world with a sovereign God makes the conquest legitimate. As a strong Catholic kingdom, it vowed to defend Catholicism and provoke propagate the Christian faith. So from that lowly boy, um, Spain tried to portray the Holy Child as a powerful image. Of course, he's a powerful God, though the, in, in contrast, it's a king, a powerful God king, child king. So the devotion to the Holy Child as a king started in Spain and spread throughout the European continent as an outcome of the counter-reformation in the 16th century, a movement of militant Catholicism that started with the Council of Trent. It spread to almost corners of the world due to the influence of the Carmelite monks and nuns in Prague and this cult Carmelite in Spain. Then during the late Middle Ages, devotion to the infant Jesus had entered the private 
fear of popular piety. Numerous documents shows that images of the Christ child in the homes of nobility and in convents. By the time of the Renaissance, some of the images were sculpted by famous artists, and many of the statues of the Christ child were produced in convents. For the nuns, the very act of modeling the Holy Child became a form of devotion, and they tenderly cared for the images entrusted to them. Thus, it's safe to say that the devotion spread around Europe. So, of course, the baby Jesus then. Now, our next topic would answer the question, why on earth the Europeans reach our shores? Before going to that, so that's why you have also the Santo Nino de Praga, the Santo Nino de Michelin, as we could see now in Antwerp, or the present Michelin. That's where you could find, the, as they would say, the twin, the twin of the Santo Nino, because they are very much look alike. Tanggalan mo lang ng robe ang Santo Nino de Cebu, he would look like the Santo Nino de Michelin in Europe. There's another one like this also in in Louvre Museum in Paris. If you have you happen to to enter the Museum of Louvre, uh, there you could find also the very much alike of the Santo Nino of Michelin. Later, I will discuss why the Santo Nino of this kind of thing originated in the is the area of Flanders. Why it arrived in Spain. Going back now to our next topic, I would answer the question why on earth the Europeans reach our shores. I guess in history we all know this. During this period of exploration, European countries were racing to discover the territories and to reach the Spice Islands, which was lucrative merchandise during that time. So this is the reason why the European arrived at our shores. We cannot say that came because they would like to subjugate the Philippines. There was no Philippines yet then. In fact, it was only accidental due to bad weather. And of course, to look always for replenishment of supplies they needed on board on the way to Spice Islands. Now, uh, here comes the scene of Ferdinand Magellan in 1521, the famous song of Yuyu Bilyame of March 16, 1521. As we all know, they embarked from the port of Seville, from the port of San Lucar de Barameda, um, en route to find the Spice Island. Our sole soul or uh, source of, of the Santo Nino that he arrived in our shores and it was given to the queen as a gift after her baptism is the account of Antonio Pegafetta. Antonio Pegafetta was an Italian and he was hired as a chronicler of the Spanish crown during the voyage led by Fernando Magallanes. So it was not solely a fleet composed by Spaniards, but of course, um, Ferdinand Magellan was a Portuguese and his chronicler was an Italian, Antonio Pegafetta. So that's our basic source of the information of the details of the arrival of the Spanish fleet in 1521 in the Philippines. However, I would like to warn you that um, such, such account might, might um, there are some translation that would mislead our readers today regarding the Santo Nino because um, the translation sometimes is different from the original account, especially those translated by from from French to English is somehow would differ from the Italian to English. We would see that later. So to make it faithful, I would love to read to you the translation coming from the Italian. This is how it is being narrated according to, to Pigafetta, how not the arrival itself, but how the Santo Nino was given to the queen. I know you have read the, the first voyage around the world written by Antonio Pigafetta, but I don't know if you have, a, have the chance to, to read it. They are all available actually in Amazon if you would like to find. April 14. 1521, Sunday, Magellan went ashore together with his 40 crews. 
According to the narrative of the Gafeta, a large cross was set up in the middle of the square. That's why we have the Magellan's Cross in Cebu. This one actually also involves another controversy. We will discuss it later. Then the captain told them that if they wish to become Christians, the Cebuanos, as they declared on the previous days, they must burn all their idols and set up a cross in their place. They were to adore that cross daily with clasped hands and every morning after their custom, they were to make the sign of the cross, which the captain showed them how to make. And they ought to come hourly, at least in the morning, to that cross and adore it nearly. I would love also to say that, of course, in our Philippine history, we learn that when we hear the word Castilla or Espanolist, they were like bad people, or we associate them with the word Mananakop, no, or Kankeros. It's always like that. Now, they subjugate the Filipino, they killed all the natives. No, it wasn't like that. Actually, if you're going to study the life of the personality of Ferdinand Magellan, actually, he was very religious, a very pious man that he would um, um, go to mass every day or attend a mass every day. Of course, every fleet that they have would always have to have the, a, a chaplain accompanied by a chaplain. That's why you have there Pedro Valderrama as the chaplain of the fleet of, of Magellan. And the rest actually of the crew were, of course, would follow what, what, the, what the, the captain would say. So if they're gonna say a mass, everybody should be there. And so it, it, it's different from the fact that we learned that um, Magellan would just simply uh, um, arrive at our shores and then subjugate and then kill the natives. No, it was nothing like that. It was actually a very friendly encounter between them until such time that they had this Lapu-Lapu encounter in Mactan, that everything turned sour in history. Then the cup let's continue the captain led the king by the hand to the platform while on the same day while speaking these good words in order to baptize him referring to humabon he told the king that he would call him don carlo after or carlos after the sovereign emperor 500 men were baptized before mass after the conclusion of mass the captain invited the king and some of other of the chips to dinner, but they refused, accompanying us, however, to the show. So actually, Magellan was very polite. He invited Raha Humabon for a dinner to the ship, but they refused to. Um, there was no reason mentioned why um, Humabon refused the invitation of, of um, Magellan. After dinner, the priest that is uh, Pedro Valderrama and some of others went ashore to baptize the queen who came with 40 women. So men were baptized first then later the women. We conducted her to the platform and she was made to sit down upon a cushion and other women near her until the priest should be ready. I should, this is, a narrative coming from Pegafeta. I should, I showed her an image of Our Lady and a very beautiful wooden child Jesus and a cross. I would like to repeat that one. I showed her an image of Our Lady, a very beautiful wooden child Jesus and a cross. In therefore, she showed her three different icons not to because in other accounts it 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 appears that um, um pegafeta only showed to to queen juana two icons we will find that later as well in our discussion in, therefore she was overcome with contrition this is the reaction of juana she was overcome with contrition and asked for baptism amid tears. We named her Johanna or Juana, counting men, women, and children. 
we baptized 800 souls on that day. The queen was young and beautiful. She was entirely covered with white and black cloth. She asked to give her the child Jesus to keep in place of her idols. And then she went away. So she asked for, after Pegafeta showed her the three icons, she chose to have the child Jesus. She asked for it. The captain general went ashore daily during those days to hear mass and told the king many things regarding the faith. So with Magellan and the crew stayed in Cebu for a week. So they arrived in Cebu, they arrived in Humonhon in March 16, but they entered Cebu on April 7. And they conducted the baptism a week after, and that is April 14. And on the same day, however, late on that day, they also baptized the, the, the queen or Juana and the rest of the women. So that's how the, the, the chronological order of the event on, on the, in Cebu. One day, the queen came with great pomp to hear mass. Three girls preceded her with three of her hats in their scarf, cross with gold stripes thrown over her head, which covered her shoulders, and she had on her hat. A great number of women accompanied her and who were all naked and barefoot, except that they had small covering of palm tree cloth before their previous, and small carp scarf upon the head and with all the hair flowing free. The queen, having made the due reverence to the altar, seated herself on a silk embroidered cushion. Before the commencement of the mass, the captain, Magallanes or Magellan, sprayed her some of her women with mass rose water, for they delighted exceedingly in such perfumes. The captain, knowing that the queen was very much pleased with the child Jesus, gave it to her. So this is the Santo Nino. Telling her to keep it in place of her idols, for it was in memory of the Son of God, thanking him heartily, she accepted it. So that's how the, the giving of the Santo Nino took place on on a different day, that is after the day of her baptism, not after her baptism. As we could say that sometimes we could say in a play that right after her baptism, the, the Santo Nino was given immediately. No, it was not given immediately, but a day or a few days after her baptism. Um, but still, that it was during a mass, after a mass. So I guess quite clear so far how the, the Santo Nino was given, or at least um, arrived in Cebu. Now, other, as we all know that in history, no, um, Magellan went to the island of Mactan, had a battle with Lapu-Lapu, and of course, he died there. And so the fleet of the Spaniards went back to, to Spain, passing through Malacca and the rest of the southern border of, of the Indian Oceans. Now, after Spain had celebrated Elcano's return, that is, of course, when Magellan died, another, another leader, uh, another Spanish, led the, the sole surviving fleet, uh, or ship, that is, of the Victoria, um, Elcano, a Spaniard, returned to Seville. King Charles, the first decided that Spain should conquer the Philippines when the land after the encounter of the natives in, in the Far East. Five sub subsequent expeditions were then sent to the islands, so five attempts. These were led by Garcia Joffre Luisa in 1525, 
Sebastian Cabot in 1526, Alvaro de Saavedra in 1527, and Roy Lopez de Le Villalobos in 1542, and Miguel Lopez de Legazpi in 1564. Out of the five, only two actually reached the Philippines, and only Legazpi succeeded in colonizing the islands, and this is the 1565 event, which is also the arrival or with the Augustinians. Then the proceeding towards the year 1565, that is 44 years after Magellan died, the arrival of Legazpi's expedition in the Philippines with the first five Augustinians missionaries during their arrival, as they were not welcome, they bombarded the islands that burned some of the houses of the natives. We could say that this time the conquest was in full gear, not only politically, but also spiritually. The arrival of the Augustinians in 1565 during the Legazpi's expedition was all set to Christianize the country. It formally commenced the Christianization and evangelization of the Philippines. That's why what we celebrate in 1521, or in, no, I mean in this year, um, 2021, is the introduction of Christianity, not the, not the Christianization of the Philippines, because the Christianization of the Philippines or of the country happened or took place in 1565. That is during the arrival of the Augustinians during Galigaspi's fleet. Um, almost from the start the, in 1565, the missionaries hopped from island to island and walked on foot from town to town, not solely to attend to the spiritual needs of the Spaniards or the Spaniards, but also to evangelize the natives. Some of these missionaries even preferred to stay with the Filipino Indios and continue their mission after the soldiers were asked to move out or leave the area. And during this moment, as narrated by, there's a document. Um, I missed this one. Tanto, this, this document I would like to show you um, is a legal document containing a testimony or a notarized testimony regarding the arrival of the Augustinians or the finding of the Santo Nino in the Philippines. So this is in 1565 when the Santo Nino was found in a box, no? or on, we call it baul. So just to read in a way the, the account how it happened, this is how as to translate the, the content of the Tanto Juridico or this document narrating the, this, the rediscovery of the Santo Nino. A sailor from San Pedro, Juan de Camu, a soldier, a native of Bermeo in Biscaya, accompanied by an artillery man of the same ship, Pedro de Lorga entered the house where a slave was staying. So the house is a house of the, a slave or an ordinary man. They found two boxes tied up with card from Castile, ready to carry out together with the owner's belongings. They opened one of the boxes and found only the task of a wild boar and a large bow. When they opened the second box, they made, made of pine, this wood is not found in the Philippines and tied with cord from Castile, they discovered inside it a carving of the child Jesus. Ecstatic beyond himself, Camus, the soldier, ran out screaming about the find, allegedly crying in his native Biscayan tongue, or Biscaya is the region where you could find the Bil, what we call Bilbao or the famous uh, Chorizo de Bilbao. And he cried out, for the body of Christ, son of Saint Mary, has been found. So he was, he was shouting that kind of, of um, uh, those words. Fray de San Agustin. This is according to the narrative also of Fray, same in the account of Fray San Agustin, another Augustinian historian. Much of the story of the finding of the child 
Jesus is documented contained in this in this document. So the document actually the first document was ordered by Legaspi himself. However, the original was damaged and written again in 1736, and now preserved here in our convent. And this is the last thing about uh, the document of the finding of the Santo Niño, or the, the original document, we could say that uh, the Santo Niño was found in Cebu, you know, the original or the first finding. There's no other place. Other places might might say that the the origin uh, older than the Santo Niño de Cebu is the original is the one of Tondo or the other places. No, this is the, the first the first Santo Niño or the or, the original Santo Niño that was brought by Magellan and rediscovered again by Ligaspi and I mean Camus Ligas uh, Ligaspil soldier in 1565. So far. I guess we're clear on that. Now, in this last part of my talk, I would like to mention in passing those interesting details surrounding the Santo Nino devotion. Now, um, there are several accounts or historical accounts narrating um, the feature of the Santo Nino. Um, I would love to read to you three accounts coming from three Augustinian um, historians. Father, first we have Father Grijalba. The statue of the child Jesus was very beautiful. Flattering shirt, a woolly cup, and a globe in his hand. Everything was so fresh and clean and tidy, as if it had been inside the oratorio for the most powerful neat person. This is also another narrative by Juan Medina. The image of the child was dressed up with large pair of breeches or sarguelios largos or red color with small Flemish bonnet and cross inserted into it. A small cross of gold hung from a chain. It is not known whether the natives donated the jewels or this had been already with the image. Another historian, Gaspar San Agustin, had the same description. The child had a flounced shirt. His dress was of red damask with a velvet flamenco cup in the old style. It had small cross hanging from its neck, held a small gold necklace. Its beauty was so striking that everybody was drawn to it. Now the Santo Nino that we see today It's, I, I'm sorry for the image of quiet blood, but um, the Santo Nino today, it has a crown of gold embedded with few diamonds in front in preparation for the fourth centenary, centenary of the Santo Nino's discovery in 1965 and was donated by the first lady, um, Leonela Garcia of Bohol, former first lady of the Philippines, donated two carat gold crown said to be studded with 40-fold gold size diamonds. The statue of the Santo Nino stands in high circular base or ornately decorated bronze. It measures barely one foot high from the top of its crowned curly head to its now wobbly legs, elaborately adorned with pendant pearls. You can see in the image, a scepter and a staff of gold are suspended from the two fingers of the image right hand, likewise in golden globe. His left hand is fitted with golden globe holding a miniature cross signifying the worldwide kingship of the Holy Child. From the little globe, three diamonds supplied by devotees hang from the gold chains. The right hand is raised up as if in a blessing the first two fingers upraised symbolize the two no natures of Christ, while the folded thumb and the last two fingers represent the unity of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the mystery of the Holy Trinity. So that's the, the symbol, uh, symbolism, the, the attributed to the, the structure of the Santo Nino. Now, there was a time when the Santo Nino was painted black. 
Um, but before that, um, this screen, if you could see clearly, the Santo Nino has a scar in his face. Um, this is how you gonna identify if the Santo Nino we venerate in the Basilica is the original one or not. So if you happen to be in Cebu and in the, how do we call that one? In the Hagganan, no? See, so that's, look for the scar on the right side of the face of the Santo Nino. There you could see a scar. So that's how you can identify if it's the original or not. But as promised, we always put the original Santo Nino where the people venerated as when the, it was one of the conditions um, asked when they have requested the basilica, basilica to be, to be the church to be um, consecrated as a basilica. A question why, why the Santo Nino was painted black? Well, do, during the Galleon trade between Manila and Acapulco in the 17th century, two religious images painted with black were brought to the country, the Black Nazarene and Our Lady of Peace of Good Buyach in Antipolo. When the Nazareno and the Virgen of Antipolo reached Manila, they drew a very big number of devotees. The Augustinian realized that the black was more appealing to the Filipinos. So the Filipinos believed that the black image was powerful. For almost 50 years, we venerated the black Santo Nino. And during the later part of the World War II, the icon fell from its niche, leaving one of its eyes chip and its right cheek heavily scratched. That's why you could see a scar in her face. Luckily, the fall was cushioned by one of the candelabra. If not, the Santo Nino was destroyed. She was um, an, an, a Cebuano historian said that the wooden image was transported for safekeeping to the Redemptoris Church in Cebu for a while, which was under the supervision of the Americans. Then an Augustinian priest, father named Leandro Moran, asked a nun from St. Teresa's College to wipe out the face of the Santo Nino. So they were able to found that the Santo Nino's coating had second layer. So of course the original is not really black. After telling Father Moran about the Augustinians decided to restore the original color of the Santo Nino. So that's the, the color of the Santo Nino now actually. That's the original color, not the black one. Now let's, um, let's move. Um, regarding Sinulog dances, um, dancing is not actually strange in the Filipino culture. It has been part of the indigenous ritual in healing, reading, and worship, and other ritualistic, ritualistic celebrations we have. Examples we have are the ritualistic dance by our Babaylan priest or priestess that we learned in our history. That's the same with the origin of Sinulog. The early missionaries allowed the dancing of the people to be incorporated in their worship. Early accounts, however, never mentioned the term Sinulog as it is called today. It was only in the 1940s, again, in the 1940s, when the term became common. The common story we know is that it is a simple forward and backward movement simulating the water current sulog, hence the name given to the dance. It is said to be the basic steps of the original Sinulog dance. History, however, that since the early period where people allowed to dance inside the church, later in 1920s, it was stopped then was allowed only outside the church. That's why we see now the manangs. Actually, it's the continuation why the manangs are dancing outside the church. Because it was one stop. Um, it was no longer allowed inside, so they dance instead outside. Another also, another idea of this was, it actually it also evolved from the Moro Moro dance, which is a battle between Moro and Christians. And this is uh, personified by the famous group of the Diola family in Cebu, which actually you could see also on um, them dancing during those, uh, one of the novenas or I guess uh, Saturday, um, Vesperas, if not Sunday, if I'm mistaken. 
another thing I would like also to, to tell you is that the, the original feast of the Santo Nino was April 28. And that is the Kaplag when it was this rediscovered again by Juan Camus in the hat or in that payag. So the commemorative day, date of the Kaplag, we celebrate these days. It was the day the Santo Nino was found in the native's house. However, the day the Agustinians arrived in April 28, 1565, was the Feast of Saul San Vidal, St. Vitalis, in honor of the Spanish rule in the Philippines, which was more civic feast rather than religious. So in, on April 28, it was more of a, the Feast of San Vidal in the beginning rather than the Feast of the Santo Nino. So San Vidal was more celebrated as a feast, not religious, uh, as, as a civic feast of in honor of, of the crown, but not it was never, it was never on, on the Santo Nino. Since the, the reason why it was incorporated later, since there was no popular devotion surrounding the feast of San Vidal, the Santo Nino was incorporated in the celebration also was the intention of the Augustinians to get the Santo Nino in the celebration. This was the time that the Santo Nino took over the feast. So Don Mejo, um, the Santo Nino entered the scene. When Cebu was conquered, the Spaniards named the place Villa del Santissimo Nombre de Jesus. That's why also um, it was more of the devotion rather than the Santo Nino. It, um, the feast also was celebrated on, on, on January 3, uh, which is the feast of the Santissimo Nombre de Jesus, which is actually Santissimo Nombre de Jesus would also like the, um, the, the incarnation of the baby Jesus, um, giving him a name or giving uh, in personified. No? So that's the Santo Nino. Um, the reason why it was transferred from April 28 to January um, is this. Upon considering a, a, a reform in the liturgical calendar of the church, the Feast of the Holy Child, which always um, at the time fell on the, in the Easter tide, um, was untimely. Just imagine this, that after you celebrate the, the passion and the resurrection of the Christ, you would go back to the celebration again of the child Jesus. So the logic was transfer the feast of the Santo Nino near Christmas. So from April 28, it was moved again to January 3 or within the first week and the second week of, the, of January. But the Augustinians opted to have it in January 14, as the prior of the Santo Nino Church at the time, Father Francisco Villalon decided to have it on the 14th of January instead. So until such time that again, they fix it instead of January 14, they move it to the third Sunday of January. So from April to January, January 14 to the third January, Sunday of January, so that's how it, it, it moved from one day to another. I would like to talk shortly about the, the Cofradia del Santo Nino de Cebu. Um, as soon as they built the church for the Santo Nino, they also founded a Cofradia, having Miguel Lopez de Legazpi as the first hermano mayor. Although the rest of the history was silent about the Cofradia, it was it was not replaced, but some confraternity took over the devotions like the, the confraternities of the rule or the regla and the consolation. It was only lately revived in the 1920s when the, again, the, the fathers in the, in the basilica revived the confraternities of the Santo Nino. So, we could say that historically is it it is it's the the oldest uh, cofradia in the Philippines, but uh, along the way it was it was off, and um, only once it was only later that it was revived. Now another thing I would love to talk is 
our knowledge about the novenas that we use and the gusos that we sing is are heavily based on the surviving novenario prints from the earliest as the 18th century. This is the oldest uh, novena I could find here in, in the convent. So it has the date of 1788. Then it was printed in Manila. So this is where we got all the, the novena that we read today. So it is as, as old. However, the, the gozos that we sing, if you would read it in Span, in Spanish, is a very much um, literal translation of what the original actually is a actually a gozos, not for the Santo Nino, but to the holy name, to the devotion to the holy name of Jesus, not to the Santo Nino. So they crafted it out from the, the gozos from the holy name to the, to the devotion to the Santo Nino, since they, 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 they thought that it's just the same um, um, devotion. So they, they just transferred it. They said the same gozos that they used from the holy name and then now the, the, the Santo Nino. And lastly, every time we visit the, the Basilica, we gain plenary indulgence. And during, there are five days wherein you could gain plenary indulgence in, in your visit in the Basilica. First, on the feast day of the Santo Nino. Second is on the 29th June, which is the feast of Saints Peter and Paul. Third is on August 2, which is the Porte Uncula. The, the fourth is on August 28, which is the feast of Saint Augustine. Fifth is on November 5, the anniversary of the consecration of the Basilica. And the last, one is the day, the year, at the choice of the faithful. So these are the six instances wherein you could gain plenary indulgence in your visit of, to the Basilica and the Santo Nino. I go. I have not talked too much. So I would like to end this conference by quoting Luke, um, chapter two, verse fifty-two. Um, and Jesus advanced in wisdom and age and favor God and man. Thus, as devotees, we may become like the Santo Nino, who also grow not only in age, but also in wisdom and knowledge and find favor before God and man. So thank you very much. That's all. Muchas gracias a todos.